Okay, so uh, we're here to talk about uh, election rules and voting law um, and prep you uh, kind of for your work covering uh, elections going up to the uh, 2024 uh, presidential. And I can't think of two better people to help um, educate us on the state of election law and voting right now. They've uh, managed the legal side of presidential campaigns. They dealt with election law, voting rules on a daily basis, and representing candidates and parties. And I thought what we would do to start off is understand how we got where we are. So when I started teaching election law a couple decades ago, uh, election administration was kind of the most boring part of my job. It was really a backwater. Uh, it wasn't really, compared to redistricting campaign finance, as contentious and partisan. Um, and today, it's really the front line of partisan warfare and combat. Um, election litigation is tracked by academic experts, uh, has increased pretty dramatically over the last 20 years, and it's something that all of you will probably cover pretty closely. And I wanted to get Mark and Ben's sense of how we got where we are today. From this backwater that was a little bit boring for those of us that spent our time thinking about election law to kind of the most contentious, most partisan area arguably, of election law. So I thought I'd start out with Ben. Well, thank you. Thank you uh, very much for having me here. And uh, it's great that you're taking on this, uh, this really kind of difficult task in a difficult time. So we've gotten here in election administration, I think to put it in perspective, as part of real changes in the society and more polarization. And, you know, you can trace that back to the to the breakup of the Solid South, which started to polarize the country. There's a 50-year trend where people are living in more homogeneous communities so that there's very little interchange or less interchange than there was uh, among people who do not look like and act like and make money like themselves. And I think in the election era, uh, certainly the 2000 recount got everybody's partisan juices uh, flowing a little bit more. Uh, although that was a different era. And you know that was a different era because I was representing George W. Bush. And had he lost that election, should, had the count gone the other way, he would have conceded that. It would not have been the contentious 2020 uh, sort of an escapade that we all saw. And so partisan polarization has only increased since then. And it manifests itself in uh, in the election administration area. So, I, um, first of all, thank you all for staying for the lawyers. You know, we, <laughs> we're not Caitlin Collins. No, I've been confused. We, we do what we can. Um, but you know, I, I agree almost entirely with Ben, and I just want to give you like a little bit more, just historical context to it. It wasn't until 1974 that the U.S. Supreme Court said there could even be a recount in a state court in a federal election. This case out of Indiana, Rattlebus versus Hartke. And so we managed to go the first 200 years without this question ever coming up. And Bush versus Gore was important for a lot of reasons, and I'm going to skip over most of them and focus just on one, which is that if you look at most of the coverage and ask most of the legal experts, not Ben at the time, so kudos to him. Whether or not the Supreme Court would take the case, most of them would have said not, they wouldn't take the case. And so what happened with Bush versus Gore, setting aside everything else doctrinally, is it was the, in popular culture and in politics, a sense that the courts were going to be much more involved in the resolution of political disputes. You know, in 1996, there was a close Senate election in the state of Louisiana uh, that went to that that and there was an election contest and a recount neither party had lawyers the entire thing was done by the by the Senate Senate Rules Committee got together they said we'll do a recount we'll do we'll review the the potential issues and then we'll decide it never occurred to them that you would need a court in 1998 I was the senior most lawyer on the ground for Harry Reid who at the time was the number two Senate Democrat. He was in an election, close election, 400 votes. I was only, I was a fifth year associate. 
Like, there was no suggestion that lawyers were going to add anything to the equation. And that all really changed after 2000. After 2000, the sense that the courts were going to play a more central role became, um, uh, became um, part of it. Finally, I'd add one other sort of historical thing, which is there was a, there was a time, hopefully still a time, when losing candidates just conceded. I was the general counsel for John Kerry's campaign. We lost by one state. For those of you who might not be able to believe this, but Ohio used to be a swing state. Lost Ohio by, I forget what it was, 60,000 votes. 11,587. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I did a series of calls late in the night with John Kerry, said, you don't, you know, there's not a path to get 60,000 votes. Concede, and he did. In 2016, I worked for Secretary Clinton. She narrowly lost three states. We did a lot of calls. We did a lot of meetings, actually, that night. John Podesta went out, conceded. Next morning, she gave a formal concession speech. So there used to just be a sense of, like, you have close elections, but, like, you know, if you lose a close election, you've lost. Um, and that, that obviously changed in 2020. Yeah, it's changed a lot. So 2020, speaking of um, elections where the candidate refused to concede, um, by some expectations going in, we were really worried, at least experts and I think a lot of campaign lawyers were worried about how the 2020 elections would go. We had COVID, we also had Donald Trump running for election, uh, president, uh, presidential re-election, and he made it clear he was gonna sort of fight the election outcome if it didn't go his way. Um, in the end, I think a lot of experts at least viewed the performance of the system in 2020 as surprisingly good. Uh, voting went pretty smoothly, lines were down, the fights after the election, um, to some degree, at least immediately following the election, um, weren't quite as contentious as maybe people feared. Um, should we view 2020, the 2020 election, as a success, were you encouraged by 2020, or did we dodge a bullet? Uh, Mark, do you want to start? Yeah, I think that 2020 was largely not a success. I mean, it was a success in the, for the reasons you said. There were free and fair elections. Tally, results were totaled. They were tallied. They were certified accurately. Election, you know, that was all a success. I don't think you can decide that any election that ends with a violent insurrection at the Capitol as having been a successful election. Right, and so, like you, you seems fair. You have to, you have to, you can't divorce democracy from the norms around democracy. You know, a lot of the reasons why we have free and fair elections in this country is because what I sometimes refer to as the pageantry of democracy, and that pageantry is one of the reasons, by the way, why it's so hard, even in a truly close election, to overturn it in a recount because immediately on a Historically, Democrats and Republicans, election officials at the local level, get together and like fill out a bunch of paperwork to reaffirm the result. And then a ribbon gets put on that. And then that goes to the state and they put another ribbon on it. Then there's calligraphy certificates. Like there's just like this pageantry of democracy. And the undermining of that pageantry is a real loss. It is a real loss. And it is not one that we are going to overcome quite so easily by just saying that in the end, courts did the right thing, election officials certified, governors didn't call special sessions, whatever those things are, because that pageantry is what makes people go from w wanting their candidate to win to accepting what the results are. Ben. I think on one level, the 2020 election uh, was really problematic and on a broader level of success. So I think it is problematic in that a group of Americans and a significant group of Americans started to doubt the credibility of our elections and our election system, largely through the rhetorical sphere. And that, under no circumstances, is a success. What I thought was a success was the heroic work that election administrators did to produce an election that had the highest turnout in our history. You're going to hear from Brad Raffensperger, the Georgia Secretary of State in the next panel. Goodness knows he and his colleagues in the election administration field were real heroes in first bringing off the election and then standing up for the accuracy of their system against really an historically unprecedented onslaught. 
So that from your perspective in needing to cover the 2024 election, um, get to know your local election administrators and the way they explain the accuracies of, of their system. And the other part of the 2020 election that I think was a great success was the way the courts took on these unprecedented onslaughts. And judges, including many appointed by Donald Trump, who was saying the election was not accurate, rejected the Trumpian arguments. And I think in that sense, the institution of the judiciary and the sanctity of the elections was indeed a great success in unprecedented times. But boy, it was a first crack in the armor of people believing in the credibility of our elections. Yeah, along those lines, I've heard uh, 2020 described as a dress rehearsal for people who might be interested in overturning an election, which didn't happen in 2020, but we saw some of the fault lines, some of the cracks in the system potentially. Um, are we worried about, what, what are we worried about in the 2024 election? What are the things that really keep you up at night? Um, well, there are a number of things. Uh, so, so look, the, what I mentioned before about the credibility uh, of the system um, keeps me up at night. And, uh, you know, in a way, the dress rehearsal failed because of the results of 2022. I mean, election denialism was not a successful theory uh, that won elections for people in any contested statewide battleground race. On the other hand, none of the incumbents who embraced election denial lost. They paid no penalty uh, at the ballot box. So I think in that sense, it's a mixed verdict. I do worry as a Republican that election denial has crept into the position of being an anti that a Republican candidate needs in any contested primary. So if you do have a contested, if you're lucky enough to have contested races in where you're reporting, one of the real things to report out is whether and how the candidates talk about the, the accuracy of the system. Um, I think that's an important story that's going to emerge in terms of, of looking at the election. The dress rehearsals, I mean, I think Mark and I could probably sit up here and spin out two dozen scary scenarios uh, pretty well. Um, I look at the onslaught against election officials uh, and the harassment as being a real problem, retention of election uh, officials and workers is a real problem. There was a bit of a dress rehearsal about uh, some jurisdictions refusing to certify votes. Uh, if a jurisdiction refuses to certify its vote uh, in 2024, that can lead to some sort of interesting situations. Yeah, I, again, I agree with, with Ben. I want to amplify a couple of points. The first is, and this is probably a place where Ben and I don't entirely agree, and most of you will disagree with me. Election officials are neither heroic nor villains. They're just people. Sometimes they do heroic things. Sometimes they do villainous things. And so the media shouldn't fall into either trap. Like sometimes the coverage just like wants to make the election official the total villain. The election was incompetently run. They are undermining the elections. Other times they just want to make them the hero. And the truth is, there's nothing inherent about being a poll worker or a, or a county election official that makes you a good guy or a bad guy. Like, it all just depends what you do. So be skeptical of, of, of them, but don't be, don't assume that they are all good or all bad, I guess is my, is, is one, one piece of advice that where I would disagree. The second is, here is some data for you. In, in 2020, there were 150 voting lawsuits filed across the country. Okay, that's not lawsuits I was involved in, that was 150 lawsuits. About 85 of them were before the election. The rest were post-election. If you look at the ones before the election, they were overwhelmingly filed by what I would call the good guys, what you might say are the expanding voting rights side of the equation, okay? In 2022, there were 100 and 75 lawsuits 
Okay, there were more lawsuits filed in 2022 than there were in 2020. And 83 of them were filed by people trying to make voting harder or restrict voting rights. And that is a narrative that the press doesn't cover. The number of times that states are sued because the belief is their voting laws are too permissive. Right? Like you're all looking at me like I've never heard that before. There were 83 of those lawsuits. There were more of those lawsuits than there were people saying the law, the law is too restrictive. So, you know, there's a lot of coverage, as there should be, to SB202 in Georgia, to SB1 in Texas, the big, the big uh, omnibus voting bills. Florida is about to pass another one. I hope you all cover it. They're going to get sued the moment they, he files it. I sued Ron DeSantis six minutes after he, filed, after he, sued, after he signed the last bill. Um, and uh, we'll see if we can break that uh, when he signs this bill. But there's a lack of, of coverage when you see that the RNC is suing. What are they suing over? Or they're not suing to make voting easier. They're literally suing to make voting harder. They are telling the state of North Carolina, your laws are too, per are too permissive. They're telling the state of Pennsylvania, your laws are too permissive. And that, I think, has real trouble flashing as we go into 2024. So Ben, Mark's had his chance to complain about something that he thinks journalists aren't covering enough in election law. What is that for you? Is there an issue or a story out there that journalists ought to be covering, but they just don't? Yeah, let me give you a different frame. Mark is a really effective advocate for his side and his causes, and obviously very passionate about Thank that. Thank you. Which, which I appreciate, no matter how wrong he is. If I'm coming <laughs> um, but thanks for the setup. Um, look, I want to give wanna, you. I've been playing your straight man for 20 years. <laughs> There's always room for improvement. The only, thing, the only thing I always try to squeeze in is I was in Washington State in 2000. I won my recount. So I, you never. I, never, I was I not was, in Washington. I wasn't State. in Florida. The weather was better in Florida. Um, but look, here, I'm going to give you a different frame for the battles that Mark is talking about. I think that the greatest worry and the big picture story is the credibility of elections and the charges that elections aren't accurate. It is a, it is a Republican charge right now. But I ask you all to imagine the scenario of Donald Trump running and winning in 2024, and whether the Democrats will just sit back, sit back and say, oh, the, of course the elections were credible. And so that's why this whole issue of credibility can cut two ways. Mark talked about the suppression laws uh, that have been passed. Um, I want to submit to you that what you're really seeing now is a two-sided coin of charges of fraud by Republicans and suppression by Democrats. And I don't mean that as a moral equivalent answer, but I want you to look at the get out the vote programs that are used by each political party. Republicans yell fraud to get their base out to vote. Democrats yell suppression to get their base out to vote. Understand that those charges and counter charges are, do hurt the credibility of the system. And there is now so much money wrapped up in the fraud and suppression industrial complex between consultants making money on that get out the vote motivation and the incredible number of lawsuits Mark mentioned um, and the amount of money that has gone in by people on both sides to file suit that it is really hard to step off that treadmill of the fraud and suppression narrative. So that when you see these um, issues erupt in your states, which you surely will in many of them, take a step back, ask about the real world effects of the laws that are being passed, because there's been a predictable pattern amongst, in both red states and blue, when laws are passed. There is an awful lot of heat of rhetoric heated rhetoric in the legislature. Um, there are predictions of dire consequences for the democracy. Uh, the laws are passed, and the impacts, according to academic studies, which will make Mark a little bit crazy, 
but according to the academic impacts, is that it's not a real effect on the turnout and the results, but it is taking a huge toll on the credibility in the system. So, I, I, it, again, it is a plea that as you are covering these stories in your states, you take a real careful look beyond what the, the involved politicos are saying about those laws to really try and understand uh, their potential impacts. Mark, you want to add anything? I mean, I, I, I disagree that, that voter suppression doesn't matter to voters. You know, the, the fact is, the fact is, if you are in this room and you are not in college or black, you don't wait in line to vote. So it's really easy to say that, like, long lines don't create voter suppression. Nobody wants to wait in line to vote. How many of you would wait in line four hours to vote if I told you that's what it would be? A handful of you. But, like, let's be honest, I wouldn't. I mean, I don't want to wait in line for four hours to vote. Why do you think the students at the University of Michigan do? Why do you think the black voters in Texas wanted to? It's not a celebration of democracy. There's nothing, the AP wrote this horrible story about how look, look at the celebration of democracy. That's not a, cel that's a failure of democracy. And we're not failing rich white neighborhoods. We're failing college campuses and we're failing black voters. And so to me, I look at the issue of voter suppression and say the fact that those voters will wait four hours in line to vote is not a sign that there is not voter suppression. It is a sign that nobody gives a crap that there's voter suppression or the people do care that there's voter suppression and they like it. And so I just don't buy the idea that, that it doesn't matter. When Idaho passes a law that they just passed that the entire bill is to say you can't use college IDs to vote. It doesn't, even in, it doesn't even spare us the indignity of reducing any other kind of voting. It doesn't even have the fig leaf of, of adding gun licenses. It just says we don't want college, voting, college student voting here. So sure, will those Idaho college students figure out some way around it? Maybe. But don't tell me that it doesn't matter. Of course it matters. Does matter, not quite what I think I said. But let, let's look, if you get a long line story in your jurisdiction, do this. So I was part of a bipartisan uh, yeah. presidential commission with, with your former You're partner. Right. And we looked at long lines. And, and nobody should have to wait in line for more than half an hour. But here's what we also found, that there were jurisdictions or voting places that had very long lines. But what we did was go to the neighboring jurisdictions, same demographic makeups, to see if all precincts in that area had a long line. And you know what, they didn't. Because while I said what election administrators do is heroic, it's also true, as, as Mark noted, that not all of them do the right thing every time. And Election administrators sometimes do not allocate their resources right, have it in the right place. But if you get a long line story where there's cries of outrage about voter suppression, look at the neighboring uh, polling places also and see if they've got long lines to determine if it is an election administration screw up or indeed some sort of voter suppression. So can I just add 20 Very seconds? Quickly. 20 seconds. Number one, there's a study, it's online if you can't find it, ask him, he's an expert on these things, that use cell phone ping data, and it showed a racial disparity, okay? This is like, literally, I didn't know you could buy cell phone data, but apparently you can, and they saw that black voters wait longer in line to vote than white voters do, and they broke it down by county, and it is true in rich counties and poor counties, in blue states and in red states, number one. Number two, um, your long line report was right. You said no one should wait more than 30 minutes in line to vote. So here is my challenge. If there's an election official out there, like just ask them about this. Pass a law that says no voter waits more than 30 minutes in line to vote, and if they do, the state pays them. Pay them 50 bucks, $15 an hour, whatever. Pick what it is, but that voter has suffered an indignity and the state should acknowledge it. In the same way you want your airlines to acknowledge it, when you waited two hours in line to get on a plane, 
pass a law it just says you have a right to vote 30 minutes, no, wait no longer than 30 minutes, and if you do, the county or the state will pay you for your time as a token for the indignity that you had to bear. Okay. Just, just, Bipartisan just, legislation. Just as a factual matter, understand that decisions on number of voting machines, design of polling places, is all done on the county level. County those side. are not, those are not, that's fine, but those are not state decisions. So that when a jurisdiction suffers long lines, in fact, that is because of the administration by people on the local level. I agree. Well, but that's not always the evil Republicans. I didn't say the Republicans, I said in red states and in blue states, in red counties and blue counties, in rich counties and in poor counties. Those people who had to wait in line can correct that situation when they go to vote on those election administrators. Okay, so in four minutes, we're gonna take questions from the audience. So I'm instructed to tell you to start queuing up at the microphones if you, if you have questions. But before we get to that, I do wanna talk about whether there's been a change in personnel at the election administration level. There is talk of a, a great resignation, I've heard, um, among people who oversee elections in, in various capacities. Is that something that we should be worried about? Because in 2020, sometimes we were one vote away, and now we may have different people making those decisions. Yeah, it is a problem. Uh, as you get to know your local administrators, which you should certainly do, you should ask about uh, how easy it is to, to get people to work at the polls, whether the actual administrators are new or not. Uh, the job has become, in some jurisdictions, uh, really unbearable, and a lot of good people uh, have left. But a lot of good people remain, uh, and you've got to sort it out in, in each jurisdiction. Do you have a sense of that, Mark? Look, there's a story today, Cochise County, Arizona, rural Red County, they refused to certify the election results in 2022. I sued them, we won. We got fees, you thought that might stop them? They fired their election administrator who had agreed with our side. So she, she laughed. And today they just appointed a crazy. An, a crazy election denier. So yes, I worry about it. I worry about it for the same yeah. reason Ben said. Yeah. What would you change about election law? So what's the most impactful thing that we could see that would address some of these problems that we're identifying. I think, Ben, you're more worried about sort of post-election. Marx sees this all as part of one piece. That's fine, but what are the things that you'd want to change? Well, the change is, is mostly attitudinal. I mean, there are some laws I would surely change, but it's much more, I think, attitudinal in the adversary fraud versus suppression. Is there a way to put the genie back in the bottle? At least, you know, speaking as a Republican, I've had this conversation a lot. How do, how do we get Republicans to trust the process more if we think that the process isn't as troubled as, as some people think it is? Very important initiatives to uh, basically validate all stages of the election process. So election administrators in the past cycle recognize that great transparency in the way ballots are cast, counted, and certified is important. And so uh, letting the de deniers in to ask all the questions they want is. Mark. Uh, look, I think that, that I, I, would, I would pass a law that requires states to be voter-centric. You know, uh, people think I only attack red states, and that's just not true. So here's one for you. Colorado rejected 29,000 mail-in votes. Is there anyone here who believes there were 29,000 fraudulent votes in Colorado? Does anyone think there were 29 fraudulent votes in Colorado? The, the, the fact that, that we, we have a regime across the country that is just not voter-centric, it's part of the reason why I said the unpopular thing about don't make the election officials the thing, the hero or the villain. It's about the voters. It's not about the election officials. It's not about their convenience. It's not about how much time they need. It's not about any of that. It's about the voters. And so if there's one thing I would change, which is like a very wonky thing, so it's good you're a law yeah, professor, I, I, I would apply strict scrutiny without any safe harbor for states. I think the worst decision in the voting arena was the Anderson Burdick, adoption of Anderson Burdick as a balancing test. We don't balance the First Amendment for speech. We don't balance fundamental rights. And so states, if they are restricting voting rights, they should have to show they have a compelling state interest to disadvantage the voters. 
And yeah, people will say, well, that will cripple the ability of election officials to, put, to, to administer elections. No, it won't. It will make them voter friendly in the same way that it, local, local folks have to be protester friendly. They have to be permit friendly when it comes to people holding rallies or doing marches. And the, the, what, the, so the one thing that I wish in the Freedom to Vote Act that had gotten through was a provision, it's in there, it's actually Manchin who put it in, that, that created a recasting of a right to vote that is subject to the equivalent of heightened, I'm not sure it was strict scrutiny, it may have been intermediate. We can, we can nerd out afterwards. You can explain that to them. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna turn to audience Q&A, and uh, I already see a queue at both microphones, and we'll sort of alternate. If you could, we'll start over here, and if you could just identify you know, your name and organization before you ask your question. Go ahead. Hi, Surin Kim with ABC News again. Um, I'm glad Mark mentioned uh, the lack of uh, stories about all the lawsuits on election laws because um, it's a topic that we've been trying to cover a lot. But one of the challenges that we've been seeing is how to navigate the dueling narratives that are, that are being, you know, sent to us from those who are saying that a lawsuit is restricting voting rights versus people that are saying that um, they're trying to secure election integrity. Um, and, and I realize that so much of it comes down to the specifics and the details of each lawsuit and the, you know, the, the rules and laws that are being um, uh, targeted. Um, but, you know, I, I'm wondering if you guys have any advice on how to navigate that and to cover that at a national level or even at a local level. There are neutral people you can go to, although I, I use the term neutral really advisedly here because it is such a polarized area. So I think what you have to do is find some people knowledgeable in election law and administration who can give you kind of an honest analysis and are not the partisans. Mark does an incredibly effective job of explaining his position on issues. The Republicans have a, a machine built to do the same thing. You need, a, you need to find some neutrals. I'd go to retired judges, uh, maybe election law professors uh, in, in your area to sort of uh, help you through it. I, I have a very different take. <laughs> and I'm gonna, I apologize because I think this may hit her, close to home with ABC. Just don't start with anyone named Nate who has a BA from some obscure liberal arts college. I have an obscure, I have a, I have a, a, a degree in government from Hamilton College. That doesn't qualify me to decide whether a voting law matters or not. Start with the parties. It's the complete opposite. Start with the people who have skin in the game. Who's, who's got skin here, right? In, in 2008, the Obama campaign filed a lawsuit against Houston. I'm not sure who Houston was, Ohio. Ohio Secretary of State. Like, that's, that's real skin in the game, right? Like, presidential campaigns don't file a lot of voting rights lawsuits. So start by asking them, not someone named Nate. You know, like, sure, ask Husted. You know, ask, ask, ask Raffensperger, if it's in Georgia. Like, get the people who are in the game for their perspective. Because I actually find the opposite thing, is what happens is you go to someone who's with some 501c3 organization someplace, who or you know teaches law not at the Pritzker School. I love the Pritzker School. Great governor you have here, by the way. Love the governor of, of Illinois. Great school. But you go to some law professor or some political science professor, and they're like, well, I think. All right, well, you think that. That's wonderful. But like, what about talking to, if the NAACP of Florida is filing a lawsuit, why don't you talk to the NAACP of Florida and have them put you in touch with the voters who they say are affected by it? rather than just retreating to this neutral who is sitting in a Washington DC office, just like saying, well, I think this and I think that. So I would go the other way. I'd go with the people on the ground who are actually affected or the people on the ground who work for the election officials and say, look, this is the reason why this law makes sense. Yeah, the fraud suppression industrial complex right there. <laughs> okay, over here. Hi, my name is Bridget Bergen. I'm from WNYC. Um, I've covered a lot of stories about elections, uh, long lines, purges, lawsuits. 
Uh, my question for you guys is, you know, a lot of times these stories are happening in real time. You're reporting something and you don't necessarily know if it was an administrative error or if it was something, you know, that was done to suppress voters. But the effect may be voter suppression either way. So I know that you're not reporters, but you're lawyers. But what is some of the guidance you might offer in terms of, you know, you know something has happened that is indicative of a problem. You know, people are sent uh, duplicate ballots or, you know, so there's so many different variations. You know, how do you report it so that you are, you know, not trying to go into either narrative, but you know, tell the story as factually as you can. So I think, look, I think you, your question is like really important and it actually hits to me the key point. The reason why I say be voter centric is intent is much less important to me. Like the question, if 4,000 voters were disenfranchised and 4,000 voters were disenfranchised, and that is the story. The, sometimes the media actually goes the other way, which is like four voters may have been disenfranchised. Like I get a lot of calls from reporters who are like, is anything going on? Well, like, so, sure, something's going on, <laughs> but, but it may not be significant, right? Like, I think contextualizing what the scope of it is is the place that reporters sometimes go wrong. It, you know, it was a one-car accident. It wasn't a 50-car accident. But I think that, th that the fact that there's the accident is the, you know, the fact that the thing happened is more important than whether it was intentional or unintentional, at least from my standpoint. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think that the toughest um, problem that you've got, and I say this as a former reporter, is knowing how big the problem is. Right. I mean, that's the really difficult I context agree. of it. And, you know, that's shoe leather reporting more than, than anything else. And I also think one size doesn't fit all. The circumstances and the stories are, are, so, are so different. But... I mean, talking to the people involved is certainly true, but you have to be able to get a perspective on it. Okay, so I think we have time for maybe two quick questions. So short questions, short answers. Go ahead. My name's Julie O'Donohue. I work in Louisiana, and I am always thinking about what happens if a hurricane hits the week of the election, what, what's going to happen in that type of situation. I was curious if you could talk about any examples yeah. or, or how states have handled natural disasters yeah. hitting close to elections. So Not this, Hurricane Katrina, because I'm familiar with Yeah, it. so this seems to happen in Florida. Like, for whatever reason, the day of the closing of voter registration in Florida, the, the voter registration database crashes, and I think Florida makes, always makes sure there's a natural disaster to correspond with it. Um, we've had it, and one of the things that I worry about is that historically the way it's been handled is very practically, like very practically. Superstorm Sandy in New Jersey, very practically. In Florida in 2018, there was a hurricane. There was also a bomb threat. Uh, if you remember, there was a guy making pipe, pipe bombs, sending them out to news outlets. That came out of the central mail facility in Florida, so the central, central mail facility was shut down. And historically, you know, I don't want to say that the lawyers worked it out because I don't work it out. I don't literally work it out with Ben. But everyone is kind of like, let's just use common sense, which usually means making the rules more lax, making the voters, which, by the way, in 2018 meant that a whole bunch of Republican counties in the panhandle got to vote through mechanism means that would not have otherwise been the case. But like, it never occurred to me to be like, no, no, they can't do that. And likewise, that's been true with the Republicans. Now, I don't know what happens post-2020 when that happens. Um, well, it's a great question. Let me put in a plug and urge you all to watch the, uh, the next few episodes of Succession, in which you will actually see fantasies of that world played out. Um, I, I think the answer is that there is always a Both sides know that you got to let the people who are affected vote. And the largest issue it comes down to generally is what's the population that's included in there that gets to vote. Would Donald Trump agree? that everyone should be able to vote in that circumstance? Well, I think you've got to do it by geographic location, but that's why you should watch Succession, because no, it's not always true that a candidate would, would think that. But generally, that's what the fight comes under. OK, really quick question. Sorry, really quick. Hi, Olivia Rinaldi, CBS News. And as someone who's getting caught up on Succession, I really appreciate that you did not give any spoilers. I've worked really hard. Uh, my question, though, is, <laughs> is there, 
Um, what is the one state that gives either of you the most concern in 2024? Well, I'll give you four. I can't, you know, it's like, which is my favorite kid? Kind of, I can't break it down like that. Uh, but Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin are probably the ones that have the most potential impact that are kind of on the knife's edge the most. Brad and Jordan may disagree with that, but. So I actually would be interested in um, the Georgia Secretary of State's sort of view on this. The states that always worry me the most are the states that have hyper-localized control of elections. So Pennsylvania, frankly, comes to mind. The Secretary of State of Pennsylvania has almost no power over the what the counties decide their election rules are. I much prefer states, even when I don't like the Secretary, even when, I, when I'm not thrilled with the Secretary of State, where there are uniform rules across the state. And, that, and, and, and as we've seen more election deniers at the very local level, I worry about the states like Pennsylvania, where there's just very little that the statewide can do to actually influence that. I don't know actually in Georgia which way it is, but I'd be curious to know where that falls. But for sure, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin fall in that category. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so that's all the time we have. Thanks to uh, Ben and Mark, and thanks to all of you for having us. Next up is a discussion with uh, a couple secretaries of state from battleground uh, states. Thanks.